Good morning, church family, and those of you who are watching across the internet, happy 4th of July. We're glad that you could join us for today's message, which is entitled, Let Freedom Ring. And our main text is in Isaiah 45th chapter, verses 8 through 10. Isaiah 45, verses 8 through 10. Now the phrase, let freedom ring, comes from the patriotic song, America, which is also known as, my country, tis of thee. And the line says, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. Now the conclusion to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech states, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plains, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I will go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mohill in Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Let freedom ring. Let's go to God in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And, and Father, we thank you for the men and women who have served this country and have given their lives to ensure the freedoms that we all enjoy. Father, we thank you that we have been for the last 200 and almost 50 years, a free nation. Father, we thank you so much for the even better freedom that we have through Christ. And that is the freedom that we have from the power of sin. That Jesus died upon that cross and shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life with you. Father, I pray that you would be with me this morning, that as I speak, your spirit would anoint me and guide me and would help me to be able to communicate your word clearly and effectively. Father, open up our hearts and our minds and our ears this morning to your word. Father, help us to take it into our hearts and into our lives and be able to share it out through the things that we do and the things that we say. Father, I pray that someone would come to know Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much for the spiritual freedom that we have, as well as our national freedom. And Father, we pray that we can let freedom ring 
and we can spread the gospel, the, the message of salvation in Jesus Christ, not only to our community, but to our entire world. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, freedom is such a precious and long sought after privilege. For centuries, people have been deprived of freedom, being ruled by tyrannical dictators and longing for the opportunity to be free from that burden and hardship. Over 400 years ago, people from Europe escaped religious persecution and came to what is now known as America. Almost 250 years ago, men fought and gave their lives to be free from the rule and taxation of the British crown in the American Revolution. Freedom was quite costly and someone prepaid it on your and my behalf. Now you never met them and you'll probably never know their name, but they paid for your and my freedom in muddy, polluted uh, trenches decades ago and half a country away. They paid for it on the beachfronts that were soiled with blood and body parts of strangers. They paid for it cold and alone on frozen countrysides where some of their bodies still remain. Generations of Americans have sacrificed family and future body and breath, so that you and I could be born into this easy liberty that we have come to believe that we deserve. And that's the thing about personal freedom that many people seem to be missing over the last year and a half to two years. But it was never supposed to be just about you or just about me. It wasn't purely about independence as much as it was about interdependence, about loving our neighbor as ourselves, about being our brother's keeper, about caring for one another, because we're all in this together. That's what the patriotic anthems declare. That's what the statues proclaim and the songs ring out freedom. However, it wasn't just for my personal freedom, but for the freedom of us all. Now, freedom isn't about my right to do whatever I want without any consequences. No, it's about the ability to live my life righteously as God desires. Now, the Apostle Paul addressed this very thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24. He says, everything is permissible. He's quoting what the people are saying. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek out his own good, but the good of others. Now, Paul saw a problem within the church where Christians were going around saying, I had the right to do anything. And they were displaying very selfish attitudes toward their liberty in Christ. And we have liberty or freedom in Christ. We're living in an age of grace under the New Testament, whereas in the Old Testament, they lived under the, the age of the law. And they had to abide by certain rituals, and they had to perform animal sacrifices yearly to be able to, to atone temporarily for their sins. And so I'm glad that we live in freedom in Christ, in liberty in Christ. But Paul is saying that these Christians were looking out only for their own interests. 
They are their worship services and specifically the observance, the observance of the Lord's Supper was suffering because of this selfish attitude. And so Paul is saying that while some things may not be wrong, they may not be in the best interest for others. And as Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we should be sensitive and gracious when it comes to others. Now, while we have freedom in Christ, we should not exercise our freedom at the cost of hurting or alienating a brother or sister in Christ. And so we are not to consider only ourselves, but we must be sensitive to others. Now, earlier in chapter 9, Paul defended his right as an apostle of Christ. But I want you to notice what he said in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, he says, If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. And notice what he says in verse 15. But I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. For I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. And in verse 19, he says, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. And so we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 22, Paul declares that he has freedom to do anything. However, in verses 24 through 27, he emphasizes a life of strict discipline. And the Christian life involves both freedom and discipline. And so the goals of Paul's life were first to glorify God and second to bring people to Christ. Therefore, he stayed free of any philosophical position or material entanglement that might sidetrack him while he strictly disciplined himself to carry out his goal. For Paul, both freedom and discipline were important tools to be used in God's service. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow our freedom in Christ to interfere with our faithfulness to Christ. And the Christian life is all about sacrifice. At times, we must even give up something good in order to do what God wants. We give up something good for something greater. So each person's special duties determine the discipline or denial that he or she must accept. And like Paul, without a goal, discipline is nothing more but self-punishment. But with the goal of pleasing God, our denial seems like nothing when compared to the eternal, limitless reward that is ours in Jesus Christ. Now, in our main text, we are reading about the prophecy that took place about 95 to 100 years prior to the fall of Judah, the southern kingdom, and its capital, Jerusalem, to the Babylonians. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken captive by the Assyrians about 40 or so years prior to this. And God had been warning Judah that if they didn't repent and turn back to Him, then they would experience the same fate as Israel. And they totally disregarded those warnings. 
And so God told them that they would be taken into captivity. They would be exiled. That was the bad news. But the good news is they would eventually be set free and Jerusalem would be rebuilt and inhabited once again. And so God would raise up a Gentile ruler named Cyrus, which we read about in verse 13. And he would be divinely uh, enabled to accomplish the purpose for which God made him. God had formed Cyrus and raised him up according to his sovereign purposes to act according to his will in righteousness. Now God had done this so that his exiled people might be free and that his city, Jerusalem, might be rebuilt. Now we see that the Lord works predominantly uh, over the world and individuals because he created both the world and its people. And so it's his right as creator and sustainer. Those he created have no right to defiantly question the Creator's ways. And so what God does, He does in righteousness in order to bring forth righteousness. However, people like to quarrel about what God does, particularly when it comes to them. Well, first, we see in our main text, God's call to creation in verse 8. So listen to God's call to creation in verse 8. He says, You heavens above, rain down righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness grow with it. I, the Lord, have created it. And so we see that God can speak to the heavens and bring rain. And that's true in a literal, natural, or physical sense. But it's also true in a literal, spiritual sense. So God can send a flood from heaven like he did in the days of Noah. Or he can let the skies pour down righteousness. And God can really send a blessing from every direction. It comes down from the heavens And it comes up from the earth. And it's important to see that salvation and righteousness always spring up together. And when God brings salvation to a life, he also brings righteousness to that life. And so they spring up together. And so God's natural creation is called to serve the Lord of salvation. And so the picture here is one of abundance, an abundance of righteousness. And so the heavens pour down God's righteousness, and the people of the earth are to respond and be saved. And those saved bear fruit, or bear the fruit of God's salvation, which is always accompanied with righteousness. And so God deals with mankind in righteousness, and he pours out his blessings upon them that they might become righteous. And so God always does right and deals righteously with others. And so those who open themselves to his righteousness will have it, and it will grow in their life. And so when God rains down righteousness from heaven, if the people will open up, a great harvest of salvation will spring up. That is, people everywhere will know the Lord. Well, God is the only one who can deliver Therefore, it is to the Lord alone that Israel and us should look in order for the darkness to be turned into light and the trouble to well-being. 
Secondly, we see in this text, man's resisting the Creator. In verse 9, it discloses mankind's rebellion against being clay. And we hear people today who don't like to be told what to do or how to live, whether it's from other people or whether it's from God himself. They object to the idea that they are to be like clay, being molded and shaped by anyone other than themselves. They want to be in control and do as they please. Verse 9, God says, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a potsherd among the potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, What are you making? Does your work say, He has no hands? Now, woe is a statement that expresses dissatisfaction and pain and emphasizes the seriousness of God's complaint against these quarrelers. Now, it is plain foolishness to resist God's plan and will in one's life, just as it would make no sense and even be foolish for a piece of pottery to question and challenge it's potter. Well, knowing that God is the creator of all things, it should make us hesitant to oppose him in any way. See, it's foolish to oppose our creator because since he made us, he can break us. But because he made us, he knows what is best for us. Now, the only thing more foolish than the creation resisting and opposing the Creator is for the creation to believe that there is no Creator. Now, Isaiah pictures a clay pot, the handiwork of the potter saying, my potter has no hands. In other words, he's saying, I have no Creator. Now, both Psalm 14, verse 1, and Psalm 53, verse 1 read, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, some take these, these verses to mean that atheists are stupid. In other words, they, they lack intelligence. However, that's not the only meaning of this Hebrew word translated as fool. Now, in this text, the Hebrew word is Nabal, which refer, often refers to a wicked person who has no perception of ethical or religious truth. And so the meaning of the text is not unintelligent people do not believe in God. Rather, it means sinful people do not believe in God. In other words, it's a wicked thing to deny God. And a denial of God is often accompanied by a wicked lifestyle. Psalm 14 is really a study on the universal depravity of mankind. And many atheists are very intelligent. And I think that that's part of the problem, why they have a hard time believing and putting their trust and faith in God. So it's not intelligence or a lack thereof that leads a person to reject a belief in God. No, it's a lack of righteousness that leads a person to reject belief in God. Many people do not object to the idea of a creator as long as that creator minds his own business and leaves them alone. But what people reject is the idea of a creator who demands morality from his creation. Well, rather than struggle against a guilty conscience, some people reject the idea of God altogether. And so Psalm 14 verse 1 calls this type of person a fool. 
And so it says that denying God's existence is commonly based on a desire to lead a wicked or sinful life. In fact, several well-known atheists have admitted the truth of this. Some, such as author Aldous Huxley, uh, have openly admitted to a desire to avoid moral restraints was the motivation for their disbelief. And so belief in a divine being is accompanied by a sense of accountability to that being. And so to escape the condemnation of conscience, which itself is created by God, some simply deny the existence of God. And they tell themselves, there is no overseer of the world. There is no judgment day. I can live as I please. While well, trying to convince oneself that there is no God is unwise. The point of the statement, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, is that it is a wicked, sinful heart that will deny God. And so the atheist denial actually flies in the face of much evidence to the contrary, including his own conscience and the universe that he lives in. And so a lack of evidence of the existence of God is not the true reason atheists reject a belief in God. No, their rejection is due to their desire to live free of the moral constraints that God requires and to escape the guilt that accompanies those constraints. Now, most of humanity believes that God exists, but much of humanity lives as though God does not exist. Or if he does, he takes little interest in human affairs, which is contrary to what the Bible teaches. The fools are not limited to those who openly state there is no God. They include those who profess belief in God, but live as though he does not exist. Well, in verse 10, it brings the argument to a human level. God says, woe to him who says to his father, what have you begotten? Or to his mother, what have you brought to birth? You see, the created has no say in his coming to be. It is simply foolish and counterproductive for us to question and accuse God over how he made us. Each of us has our own strengths and weaknesses, accomplishments and challenges. We simply need to accept who we are before God and look for his redeeming, transforming power to, as Romans 8, 29 says, conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, God's people needed to see more clearly that they were powerless to argue in court against the creator, the heavenly father. They were but clay potsherds, broken pieces of pottery. They were essentially useless unless he would remold them. And he would remold them, but as he determined, not as they determined. Well, God is not only the maker of the universe, he is the father of the human race. And just as it would be disrespectful for a child to criticize his parents for bringing him into the world, so it would be dis disrespectful for men to challenge the purpose of God. Well, when someone is created, voices disapproval of the Creator's work, he risks receiving a pronouncement of impending doom from the Lord. A potsherd, a broken, discarded piece of pottery, has no right to question the potter. Nor does a child have the right to question 
why his parents brought him into the world. In the same way, Israel has no right to question God, her maker, in verse 9 and 11. To question the the world's creator in verse 12. Or to question his plans to raise up Cyrus in verse 13. And so it says that to challenge God's purpose in your life is just as absurd as a piece of pottery criticizing the potter who formed it. To question or criticize God's right to design, create, and empower is foolishness. You see, you are the work of God's hands because He is the potter who molded you. He is the potter who has poured grace and mercy upon you. The potter that is fine-tuning every spiritual element of your life so that the Word of God is received clearly. He is the potter that is moving you to the next level in your purpose for Him. The potter who is pointing you in the direction that He has ordained purposed, and desires for you. Give God praise and not criticism. Neither God's people nor anyone else is in any position to challenge God's decisions. Well, there was a king in an ancient palace who commissioned a famous musician to build a wonderful harp. And in the evenings, the household would gather and spend happy hours listening to the peaceful music. Well, years went by and the king died. And the prince brought his family to live in the castle. A musician was found to play the harp, but the harp was out of tune. And no one could tune it. Well, with a heavy heart, the prince had it covered Basically a useless relic. Well, one night an old man came to the castle seeking shelter, and the prince took the stranger in. Well, during the supper, the old man kept looking at the harp and finally asked why it was covered. The prince said the harp was out of tune. It had lost its tune, and no one could tune it. May I try? The visitor asked. The prince agreed, and soon the harp brought forth beautiful music as as it had in days gone by. How is it, the prince asked, that you could tune the harp when no one else could? The stranger smiled and replied, I made the harp. So who is better to get our lives back in tune with God than the one Who made us? Ask God to tune you with His Word daily so that your life would be sweet music to His ears. And I hope that your daily prayer and mine is this I am clay in your hands, O Lord. You are the potter. Mold me as you want me to be. Press shape, change, and transform me into a vessel to be fully filled and used by you. Help me to accept whatever that is without criticism. Amen. If you're ready to be that willing clay to be molded by the potter, would you place your faith and trust in Jesus? Repenting of your sins confessing Jesus to be your Savior and Lord and be baptized according to His command for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the indwelling gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit who will start to transform you from the inside out to be what God desires for you to be as you faithfully obey His Word daily. If you made that decision this morning, God bless you. 
Would you please use the information at the end of this video to get in contact with me so I can hear about your decision and I can help you be able to, to follow up and to further that decision. I'd love to hear from you this week and I pray that, that you will seek to be that clay in the potter's hands, that you would not criticize him or quarrel with him, but that you would accept his purpose in your life and that you would be faithful and obedient to his word daily. Have a good week and God bless. Have a great 4th of July.